Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Price, and I'm an alcoholic. It's it's really wonderful to be here with you. Um, I think I got a couple of days notice. That's not last minute in the AA. I know, Karen, I'm, and, and uh, I'm grateful that I, I could do this. And it's an honor and privilege to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is for sure. Um, I, I'm a member of the Courage to Change meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, we're a small but sturdy uh, group. We meet uh, on Saturday mornings. We're an open meeting. Uh, from 10 to 11 at the Congregational Church in Raymond, New Hampshire. It is the only Congregational Church in Raymond, New Hampshire. You won't need a street address. Uh, we uh, read uh, a step and a tradition alternating weeks out of the book, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, and we discuss them. Um, the coffee's really good. Okay, I, I would say that even if it wasn't, because I learned a long time ago, if you complain about the coffee, you make it. And, and I, haven't, I haven't gotten that willing to be of service that I want to make the coffee anymore. But our coffee is really good. And, and I assure you, you would be made welcome uh, in our meeting. And so if you're ever in New Hampshire on a Saturday morning, stop by. We're, uh, we used to be a, a Zoom group uh, when everybody was, and we went back to our face-to-face -face meeting. So, um, and, and you know, uh, I, I loved the, the reading of the foreword, and, uh, and I'm grateful that we can connect in this way. Uh, it, it's really cool to be able to do this. And, uh, and the connections that I found in Alcoholics Anonymous in the rooms uh, around this country and around the world are our connections of the heart. And it doesn't matter if we're physically in the same space or not, not for me anyway, you know, um, I, I'm acquainted and, and, and already friends with a few of the people in this room, but I'm already, as I look around at, at your images and just know that, that you're here, uh, I know that I'm in a, a room full of friends because that's the case when I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so for, for a few minutes or so, uh, you know, it's my uh, it's it's my honor and it's my obligation to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and uh, and before I wander too far afield, I'm not one of these uh, slick circuit speakers who's got a got a talk planned. I, I I hope I tell you in a general way what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And, and I hope I tell the truth. I I ask God to help me with that, and He usually does. You know. Um, used to be a pathological liar, and now I'm more of an intermittent exaggerator, so things are getting better. But I hope I tell you guys the truth. That's really important to me. Um, but if I'm going to carry the message, you know, I want to make sure I say what the message is. And my message is really simple. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous works. Uh, we could open it for comments now, but but I've got probably a few more things to say. Um, and, and I know that it works. I have firsthand evidence that it works. Uh, you know, I don't know that it works because... Uh, some smart people in lab coats, you know, told me that it would work, although I'm grateful for the things that smart people in lab coats do for people like me and their research. I really am. And I, I don't know, know that it worked because I read it in a book, although the instructions in one book in particular were instrumental in saving my life. But here's how I know Alcoholics Anonymous works. Uh, I happen to be a, a low bottom every day, always more or less insanely drunk, can't function kind of an alcoholic. That's just that's how it manifests itself in me. I don't I, I don't get anything done except getting so loaded I can't find my butt with both hands. And and uh, when I can't get up off the floor, somebody offers me another drink, I'll, I'll take it somehow. That's just that's just how my disease works. Um, and I never I never stay sober for a day. There was a particular time when I was really in the teeth of this thing uh, that, that I had reason to, to kind of clean up my act. Uh, I owed the wrong people money. And I heard that the police were interested in some of my activities, and uh, and I couldn't quite get out of town. So it it it, it behooved me to keep myself uh, razor sharp. Uh, so I, I I decided to go cold turkey off of booze, and I also was a drug abuser. But I know that I'm in a meeting about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I won't focus on on that substance here. But 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 uh, but I did did all that stuff, and, and and I and I stayed completely clean and sober for nine days in a row. Um, it's unlikely that we cross paths in any one of those nine days, but if we did, I apologize <laughs> just, just on general principles because it was miserable. It was horrible. It was the worst. It was, but, but I did it. I went nine days and I exerted every bit of, of effort and will that I could muster to do that. And, and, and I scraped up the money that I owed the wrong people. And, and, and I guess I felt that the attention of the law was, 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 was focused elsewhere. And on day 10 was a Saturday morning. And I woke up and did a wake and bake and cracked open a jug of brown liquor and found a, a, a bottle of pills. And uh, I was stumbling and mumbling by noon. And I had a, a nice disorderly, drunken disorderly uh, charge by 5 p.m. And I'm here to tell you 
That's the best I got. I don't know any other time that I put two or even three days back to back. But I went nine days once and broke out with such a fury that they had to lock me up before the sun went down. And here's how I know Alcoholics Anonymous works. Um, I, I came to AA and I've been continuously sober since January 1st, 1982. That's a uh, that's that's 42 years, uh, and and I say that without any there's no there's no bragging behind that. Um, I'll brag about the first nine days. I have a track record that tells me that I can go nine days. But something happened to me that that fundamentally transformed me, and I didn't do it. I didn't erupt with character or intellect or willpower, but I was transformed by this experience and in, into a guy that. Uh, that, that was on a, a, a fast train to, to check out in a real bad way before he was 30 to a guy creeping up on 68, happy, joyous, and free because I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's how I know Alcoholics Anonymous works. Um, but just a bit about what uh, what happened. Uh, I, I was a good kid from a good family. I like to say I come from the nicest, most functional alcoholic family you've ever heard of. It's kind of true. It actually is kind of true. Um, my, my dad, uh, Jim P, he was known as Gentleman Jim or Big Book Jim. Uh, he he, he uh, had a, he got sober at Alcoholics Anonymous uh, six months after I did. And uh, I know it's a day at a time, but you know, if you're gonna, if, if, if you're gonna have a sober parent, it's really cool to have a little more time than he does. And you can have a lot of fun with it. I would call my dad every anniversary. Hey dad, hang in there another six months, 10 years is awesome. I can't tell you more right now. You have to find out. But we had a lot of fun with it, but anyway, um, you know, I didn't even know my father had a drinking problem. Uh, he kind of held it together in, in, in his, in his, you know, he did some controlled drinking. Uh, I only saw him visibly drunk a couple times. You know, he didn't knock us around. He was a decent guy. He had a, he was a good dad. He had a distinguished military career and his, his drinking started catching up with him quietly and sadly alone in his basement in his forties with an executive job. Um, I'm a street drunk. We both have the same thing. That's just how it is. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm here to tell you that uh, that having a, a tortured childhood and, and, and a legacy of trauma isn't a requirement to, to, to get this alcoholism thing. Uh, I know that a lot of us have that. And, 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 and I have compassion for my brothers and sisters in AA who have that experience. Uh, that wasn't my experience. Um, I was a bright kid, pretty good athlete, uh, affable, sociable, uh, you know, uh, reasonably well-liked, good student, um, you know, didn't tolerate, still don't. Tol I don't tolerate boredom well. Um, I like, I like the spotlight. I like heaps and heaps of adoration and praise, and I don't feel like I need to do a whole lot or ought to have to do a whole lot to earn that stuff. I have a certain <laughs> entitlement about me, um, and you know, there's just something about me and alcohol. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm not going to give you a blow by blow description of of. Uh, of, of my experience uh, drinking. <laughs> and now I'm gonna to proceed to give you a blow by blow description. But I but I will tell you about the first time that I got drunk because it was transformative. Uh, I, I, I've been alive pushing seven decades and maybe the two biggest things that happened to me were the first time I got drunk and the last time I got drunk. You know, the social drinkers I talk to don't understand that, but maybe some of the people in this virtual room do. So, um, I don't know if I mentioned it, my, but my dad was a military man. Now, he had an Air Force career. And for the first 15 years of my life, the Air Force was a family business. And we'd move every year or two. And uh, so I lived many places in the US, uh, three international duty stations. And uh, at the age of uh, 13, I found myself living on an Air Force base in Turkey. Uh, and uh, and uh, there was a, to be a dance uh, on a Saturday night. And one of my buddies called me. He said, hey, do you do you want to drink before the dance tonight? I hadn't never drunk for effect at this point. I was in eighth grade. Um, I'd had the occasional sip of my dad's beer when I'd go to grab my beer out of the fridge, but I'd never drank for effect. But uh, And that was eh, 50, 55 years ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, I could still remember the, the bolt of electricity and the anticipatory excitement. And I said, yeah, how are we going to do that? Well, my dad was a sergeant and he worked for a living and he drank beer, but my buddy's dad was like a major. He might've even been a Lieutenant Colonel. He's, it was a pretty small base. He was one of the higher up officers and he, his dad had a liquor cabinet full of liquor. And when he was out playing golf or whatever officers do, my buddy raided his dad's liquor cabinet 
and poured one shot out of everything in the bar into a planter's peanut can so as to not deplete any individual bottle too much. And we took this devil's elixir behind the school and I'd seen bogey and the tough guys swig booze. So I'd never tasted alcohol. And I did one of these and it about cleared my tonsils and did a U-turn, but I kept the second one down and I kind of hovered, hovered into the dance. And uh, Tommy James and the Shondells never sounded so good. And without without a second thought, I, I just I just uh, strutted over to Patty Ruff. And now Patty Ruff was the captain of the junior high cheerleaders. And she, to this day, is the second prettiest girl I've ever seen. I had the great good fortune of marrying the prettiest girl I've ever seen. And people who've met Marcy know I'm telling the truth. Uh, but this Patty Ruff was a, and the prettiest I'd seen up to this point. And I whisked her out onto the dance floor and I shocked myself. I was busting James Brown moves. I didn't even know I could dance. And uh, and and I remember sort of somewhere in my lizard brain that was still functioning, thinking, what have I been waiting for? Because guys, I'd wanted to ask Patty Ruff to dance for as long as Patty Ruff had been on the base, you know? And I'd make the move over to ask her and I'd get that clutch. Uh, and, and I'd go ask this girl, Tracy, who I knew liked me and it would say yes. Well, I, I remember sort of laughing at, free booze, Scott, as I whisked Patty out on the dance floor. And, and I danced uh, better than I ever thought I could. Uh, I took a punch at this high school guy. He'd been giving me a bit of a tough time and got away with it. I, I, I puked my brains out. I was sick for three days. It was the best night of my life. I couldn't wait to do it again. Um, it just, I, 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 you know, it was worth the three days. It was worth the suffering. And, you know, uh, I've known Nostradamus, but that was a portent of things to come, you know. I, I would I would lay a lot on the alcohol uh, on the altar of alcohol for 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 what it did for me in the moment you know uh, and it almost killed me and and I got here just in time or it would have I, I I'm sure of that um, you know I know that we all progress differently I know that it affects us all in different ways as I said my father uh, uh, I didn't even know he had a drinking problem and I wasn't aware of that until. Uh, you know, long after my drinking problems were grabbing all the headlines in the family, you know, I, it just ran me quick. Uh, you know, at 13, uh, when I just described to you, you know, I was nearly a straight A student. I, I, I was popular. I, I did well in I did well in school. I, I could play sports. I, you know, I, I, I had kind of everything going for me. Uh, by the time I was 20, I was gone. I was gone. I, I, I couldn't stay in school. I'd been thrown out of college. Uh, I couldn't hold the job. I couldn't maintain a residence except occasionally at, at, as a guest of the, of the state. Um, you know, I, I, I and, and I was the guy that everybody shook their head and said, well, what, what happened to him? Remember, Scott, well, what happened to that guy? And I was when they shook their head over it and, and with good reason. I can tell you stories about about running the streets at night, about working in bars. I, I, I play music too about, you know, the adventures with, with booze and drugs, with bands and and, and crimes and, and, and violence. And, and I can dress this thing up, and make it sound really exciting and entertaining, you know, because I have those stories, but I'm going to, I'm going to indulge myself and I hope you'll indulge me. There's one more drinking story that I have to tell. Uh, anytime I have uh, a, a moment at the podium, virtual or, or physical, I, I share this story because it's everything that I need to remember about what my disease is and who I become when I'm actively engaged with it. So I'm 17, I'm a senior in high school. Um, I'm hanging in you know, by the skin of my teeth because uh, I piled up some pretty good grades early on and, and, the, and I'm barely doing any work. And the only reason I'm going to school is that there, there's some cute girls there and I'm able to sell drugs there and make some money. Uh, but, but so I'm, 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 go, I'm a senior in high school and my mother has uh, what was supposed to be routine major surgery. And I have to tell you, um, you know, I loved my father. Uh, he, he passed away in, in uh, 2001 with 18 and a half years of uninterrupted sobriety. And dad and I did not have any unfinished business uh, due to the powerful, miraculous, no, oh, excuse me, uh, healing of our ninth step, which we practiced on one another, both with, with pretty good reason. And, and, and there's no but there. I, I love my dad. He was a great guy. He was a fine AA. If, if you'd known him, you'd have liked him. I, he just was that guy. Um, but I've always been a mama's boy. You know, I was when I was a little guy. You know, I was when I was a big guy. Uh, Mom's been gone a few years. I still am to this very day. I tell you that to tell you this, that uh, my mother's routine major surgery uh, didn't go well. 
and, and there was some infection and some sepsis and it was very bad. And, and she almost died and was hospitalized for weeks. Um, and and this is this is what alcoholism does to me. In the weeks, six, almost six, hospital like 40 days, I went to see her twice. And once I was so drunk that she asked me to leave. Um, and, and I have to tell you, uh, where I went to high school, I had long since, I lost my license within weeks in a spectacular one car accident, fueled by booze. It was a whole thing. Um, I think alcohol, what are alcoholics known for? I think the self-employment and, and, and single car accidents, right? Something like that. Anyway, uh, I mean, I didn't have a car, but my mom was in the hospital across the bridge. It was a mile and I was young and fit. I, I could almost see it. My mother was across the, the bridge in the hospital. So every day at the after school was over, I'd say, you know, I've got to pop across the bridge and check in on mom and see how she's doing. And then I'll catch up with the guys in the woods and I'll get loaded. The woods were that way. Mom was that way. I, guys, I couldn't get across the bridge because the booze and the dope was in the other direction, you know. So so I left my mother literally sick unto death, lying in a hospital bed uh, without her only son, even 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 checking in. because so I can't get across the bridge. That's my disease, you know. My mother's, whom I love, lies suffering in a bed while I'm out getting loaded in the woods. Nothing takes precedence. I, and I would, I'll tell you, I felt like a real heel on my way to the woods. And I felt like real crap. But by the time that I got the second one down, it was fine. I'll see her tomorrow. It'll be okay. And and tomorrow never came. That's that that's 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 my alcoholism. I'm 17 and I'm so in the grips of this thing, so in the teeth of this that I can't get to my mother's bedside when she needs me. Um, you know, my life is fundamentally different as a sober man in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not like that anymore. Um, I, I tried to go to college. I, I couldn't. I flunked out. I went to night school, got admitted back into the University of New Hampshire here. And uh, and uh, I went on such a spectacular reunion bender that, that I was blacked out for a week when I came out of the blackout. I'd been elected president of the fraternity uh, that I'd pledged the first time around. I hadn't enrolled in any classes, uh, but I had this sweet deal as president of this fraternity with a nice room and access to house funds and other things. So I spent the semester pretending to be a student so I could be president of this fraternity. And I, I worked harder acting as a student as I ever would have actually gone to school. And they found me and threw me out. So I. I, you know, that was my distinguished uh, academic career. Anyway, I couldn't go to school. Um, the, the jackpot started coming uh, uh, more and more frequently. And uh, and I just hit a wall, you know. Um, I would, My parents had let me come back and I'd been living with them for about six weeks. And I was out on about a four day run and, and, and I crawled back home and, and, and my mother was there. And I said, yeah, you know, cause she'd been on me. She'd been on my, on my back about my drinking and stuff. And I said, you know, it's getting pretty bad. You know, I know you've been wanting me to, you know, go see a counselor or something. And I, I'm, I'm sick, but maybe in the morning I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll give somebody a call. Well, I don't know. She, before I knew it, she'd handed me the phone. I was talking to somebody. <laughs> she was, she knew better than in the morning. And, and, and I did go to see this counselor and he asked me uh, about my drinking. And, and I, I want to say minimize, but what I did was lie. You know, I told him, you know, the tiny tip of the iceberg and, uh, I asked him what he thought and I pressed him and, and just based on the lies I told, he said that, it, that, that, uh, that, that I had perhaps the most alarmingly advanced case of, of alcoholism that he'd ever seen in anybody who was 22 years old. And, and I'd, uh, I'd better run, not walk to an AA meeting and, and, and get sober. So I'm glad I didn't tell him the truth. He probably would have had me locked up and I probably needed to be, but I saw anyway, uh, in the summer of 79, I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, my, uh, I had been to a meeting uh, in, in 74 uh, behind that spectacular uh, alcohol fueled uh, automobile accident. I'd been to a couple of meetings because uh, my attorney said it'd probably be smart if I did that before I went to see the judge. So I did I remember thinking that's, you know, it's fine for these old people and, you know, it's not for me, but, 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 I, but I did think that people were nice, thought they were onto something. And, and I started going to these meetings and uh, my first meeting was at a sober club in Manchester, New Hampshire. It was called the Milano club. 
It was in a real dive. It looked just like a bar room. Everybody smoked back then. The walls were, had probably at one point been white, but they were kind of a, a tannish yellow, sort of sticky to the touch. And there was a pool table and people cheating at cards for money in the corner. And there was a counter. I thought it was a bar. I thought everything that was flat that wasn't a table was a bar, but it was a counter apparently. And uh, there was a coffee pot on there. And I have no, I, I love it when people, I have no idea what anybody said at that meeting. I don't know if it was a stepper, but here's what I do know. People in there were sober. They said they were, and, and, and they seemed to be telling the truth. Some of them seemed happy about being sober, which got my attention. And several of them were nice to me and, and said, introduced themselves to me, expressed some kind of interest in me and said, a couple of them gave me their phone numbers and said they hoped that I would come back. And uh, and I can't I can't overstate the importance of of that early welcome. Um, I wasn't getting a lot of return invitations back then. I'm I'm not whining. I I wasn't earning any. I I, I was always like the big book says, always more or less insanely drunk. I was that guy, the guy they shook their head about, and the, the one that people gave a wide berth. You know, um, you know, I, I, and I was pretty antisocial and and violent and unpredictable and all kinds of kind of lower nature, stumbling and mumbling stuff. So, but I, I got return invitations and I liked, I liked what, what happened to me or so. So I kept going to meetings. I, I got sober. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to drink and I wanted to use, but I got enough support and enough good things happened to me that I was able to kind of keep the plug in the jug. Um, I observed that there were steps. I saw them. Um, and I thought that those were great for, you know, you know, old farts like Neil B or somebody that uh, that, that that got really sick and needed that stuff. I, I, but my problem with drinking, I was a young cat. Uh, I wasn't drinking and, and things were starting to go my way. Now, I can read a room, so I'd give the steps enough lip service to, to keep people off my back. By this time, I had acquired a sponsor. A couple of my old friends knew Sonny M, uh, and, and, and it was best to, to stay on his good side. So I, I'd give him one up, but I wasn't doing the steps. I certainly wasn't seeking any higher power. Um, and, and I stayed sober and got this amazing life assembled itself around me. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, when I came to AA, I had a, I had a day job. I, I called them day jobs, like a, a legitimate job that, that I got a check for, not the other ways I made money. But I had a day job. I was a, a part-time janitor at a technology company and tech, the tech scene was really booming in New Hampshire in the, in the late seventies and it's uh, and, uh, and uh, when I sobered up, they took me on full time and full time student, full time uh, staff. Uh, they paid for school at night. So I took a couple of uh, technology courses at night. And so I went from a part time janitor to when I was a year sober. By the time I was a year sober, I was uh, a full time junior programmer, like really junior, junior, but like white collar, you know, like in a, in a, in a junior career job. Um, I told you that I married to the girl of my dreams. I am. Uh, and when I was a year sober, uh, we walked down the aisle and 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 we started our married life. I, I had a, a nice little apartment that you know that, that, that was an address that wasn't provided by the state. I got my driver's license back and got a car. I just had this life just assembled itself around me. It was kind of amazing. Um, if only I'd worked the steps, you know. If only I'd worked the steps, you know. Um, despite all these wonderful things that happened to me, and they were wonderful. Um, you, you know, that little, that little I, I, I desire to drink, I just desire to, 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 to run the night, you know, the desire for, for that life never went away. You know, it, 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 it quieted down for a while, but uh, about five or six months married and about 18 months of sobriety, that whisper became more than a whisper and became more insistent. And, uh, and, and little by slowly, you know, a, a, a puff here, a sip there, and I slipped back in, into a period of drinking and using drugs. Uh, I went out on a series of one-nighters for about eight months. Um, I still pretended to be sober. I still went to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and said I was sober and got my chips and, and did my speaking and all that. And uh, and my wife, who was an overnight uh, RN at the time, uh, she, she said that she was going to call my sponsor because I had one of those sponsors who, who gave my wife his phone number and said, if he ever gets out of line, give me a call. And, and she was going to take him up on it. And I told her, you know, honey, you, uh, I don't blame you for being concerned. I'm concerned too, you know, but it's not uncommon after a year or two of sobriety for there to be a period of backsliding, especially among younger 
male alcoholics and uh and but i do want to get back and get sober again if they find out i've been drinking in aa they won't let me go anymore but you can call sunny if you want and she's when i got sober did i have to make an amend for that one i really did it was just it was just scummy but i was just protecting my right to drink and after every one of these one-nighters i come out of it I say, i've got to call sunny for some reason and i talk myself out of some reason on january 4th 1982 the morning after i picked up the phone i called my sponsor and i said hey yeah i haven't been straight with you i've been uh, been drinking and doing drugs I've had a series of of one-nighters and uh and, you know, I just felt like I was looking in the abyss and, and this beautiful light that assembled itself around me was on a foundation of sand that was going to come tumbling down. And, and uh, he asked if I was ready to get serious. And I said, I, yeah, I am. I, I don't want this. And I'll tell you, here's here's what I what I did differently, folks. Um, you know, once I served my sentence of 90 meetings in 90 days, that's what I thought it was, you know, a meeting every day for 90 days. That's kind of a thing around here when you're new. I don't know if you guys do it in your area, but 90 and 90, um, I kind of went back into three or four meetings a week, which has always been my meeting cadence. And I didn't fire my sponsor because he had not taken uh, one drink. I didn't change home groups, um, but I, I became willing to, to to work the steps the way they're laid out in the big books and supplemented by, by the 12 and 12, you know, and put them into practice in my life and, and to seek, uh, seek the strength afforded me by a higher power, neither of which, uh, and there's kind of, they're kind of the same thing and neither of which uh, I was willing to do before. And, you know, I, I don't know if I can draw a cause and effect, but my belief is that that was the difference between my, in my first excited, but doomed foray into, into sober living and, and the second experience, which has persisted now over four decades, a day at a time. Uh, and, and during that time, uh, once the desire left me, it hasn't returned. It hasn't returned. Um, you know, so 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 I, I'm working these steps, and uh, and, and I'd taken my third step, and uh, I'd started to write my fourth step, um, and uh, and I was doing my morning uh, morning prayer and reading routine, and and here's what I hoped I could get out of out of this proposition if I worked the steps, I hoped because I really wanted the life that had started to assemble itself around me, I just hoped if I could work these steps and do this thing as right as I can, that I could win the fight every day. I knew, I knew that I would always want to drink and drug. I knew that that was, you know, that was, that was just my fate. I, I knew this thing was in so deep that, that, uh, that, that I'd have to fight it every day. And my hope was, and it would have been a great deal that I could win the fight on a daily basis by practicing these steps and finding a higher power. Um, you know, I had no idea, I still don't know, but at least I know I don't know, but I had no idea the real power and the real miracles that are available to us here if we stay true to the prescription of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had not a clue that what I was in for. So I'm back about three or four months and I've been, I did my third step and I'm working on the fourth and I do my morning routine. I have this sudden, hmm. I don't think I want to drink. And then I kind of, I kind of checked to make sure I wasn't lying to myself. And no, I, 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 and it, I suddenly realized I, I don't, I really don't want to drink. Like if I had an opportunity to drink right now, I don't think I'd be interested in doing that. Then I got excited that I want to drink yesterday. And I suddenly couldn't remember the last time I wanted to take a drink. And when I tell you, I can literally feel, feel the chills, just like the anticipatory chills of drinking. Cause I got really excited. And I called my sponsor and, you know, my sponsor was a busy guy. He ran a business, uh, you know, he had a family, but he was, of course, to drop, <laughs> to, to answer my phone calls at the drop of a hat. Uh, and I called him at his business and he's obviously busy. He says, Scotty, what do you want? I said, I said, I'm pretty sure I just had a spiritual awakening. Um, and uh, he expressed, my, my sponsor w w was a colorful old school AA. And he expressed, expressed his skepticism with colorful language that I will leave to your imagination. Uh, he, he said, uh, he said something like, the heck you did. He said, tell me more, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, I I, I always wanted to drink before and I've been doing these steps. And, and I said, I know you won't believe it, but I don't think I want to drink. I think like the desire really left me like, like it says in the book, I don't, I think it's gone. I said, do you think that's a spiritual awakening? And my tough guy sponsor, you could hear him soften over the phone. He said, well, kid, I don't know if it is or it ain't, but if it ain't, it's a good start on one. You just keep writing your inventory and maybe it won't come back. 
Um, I kept writing my inventory and it hasn't come back. I mean, and, 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 and from, from that day to this, it's been a day at a time of this life and everything that it has to offer, you know? Um, I've had moments of, of great joy. I've had moments of profound sorrow. I've had moments of what seemed like great success and, and moments of real failure, you know? Uh, I, I think the, the former, uh, by the grace of God, and the latter when, when, when I get in the middle of things and, and, and try, try to run them my way. Um, uh, but through it all, uh, this way of life works. You know, I have a center now that will hold. You know, there's this poem that talks about the center will not hold. My center will hold because it's not me. You know, it's in me, but it's not me. Um, and, and, and that thing that happened to me, you know, here's what I believe. I believe God knows very well what God's working with. And, and some people are tough enough to fight this thing. They really are. I, I know that the, some of our, 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 our pioneers, you know, they had the desire to drink for a while. Um, God knows that I, I'm not that strong. And did that one miracle among many in my life, but that one big capital M miracle, and and, and with, with with spiritual surgery removed that problem. I did not expel it, but it's gone from me, and it has remained gone so far, a day at a time. My prayer is that if it comes back, because I have a daily reprieve, that that that, that I'll reach for, reach for my higher power, my big book, rather than a bottle, and I have enough experience that I have faith that that'll be the case. So in my time, I've been sober. I've lived a couple of few places, you know. I I, uh, I built like a career, which is cool. You know, my my sponsor, Sonny, after about a year sober, he said he wanted me to close my eyes and dream of what my life would be like if I stayed sober for 10 years. He said, you use your imagination for good rather than evil. So I did that. And he said, take about five minutes. And I really did. And, you know, the thing I pictured, there were multiple residences and and fancy foreign cars and piles of glittery. Oh, and Marcy was there and my son and stuff and my friends and then God. And but there was a lot of that sort of shiny glittery stuff up front, you know. Um, and I started to tell him, he said, I don't want to know. Whatever you dreamed up, you've sold yourself short. You don't know what's available to you here. And boy, how right he was. I mean, I've had some level of, 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 I mean, I mean, I've had some level of, of success by by outside standards, but I'm also 68 and I'm still working. And I'm not a workaholic, so you can draw your own conclusions. But uh, but I, I'm working for a little while to to to, uh, to to have a comfortable retirement, you know, rather than you know one that 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 that's skin of the teeth, and that's that's just fine, um, you know. But what I have is I mentioned, uh, you know, the girl of my dreams. Um, unless she comes to her senses, and she still might, uh, a week from Friday. We'll celebrate 44 years of uninterrupted merit. Well, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> that applause is for her, man. I've been out kicking the coverage for that whole time, but uh, but uh, I'll celebrate. I can't speak for her. She'll at least observe, and she seems resigned to her fate, and uh, and, and and we're a good match, and, and I'm awfully grateful for her. And we have a partnership uh, that, that's that, that's spiritual to hub, and and is full of uh, of friendship and romantic love and and respect and 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 mutual interests and individual interests and and I just you know I don't know if she's perfect but she's perfect for me and 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 uh you know what God has brought together let no man uh, tear us under or something like that we have one child uh my boy's 41 he's never seen his old man take a drink never saw his grandfather take a drink uh, for that matter um I don't I don't know what the causal connection is but he doesn't seem to have that thing you know uh he 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 occasionally will have a beer. I think I had saw him have two once, but he doesn't care for it. Um, you know, he got drunk a couple of times. He says he doesn't like the feeling of being out of control, and and and, and smoked weed a couple of times. Said it made him feel weird. I said, like, yeah, "Whose kid are you?" Thank God, you know. Uh, and, uh, and 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 he's a therapist, you know. And uh, and I know he's a very good one. I know that. I, I see how he is in his field, and uh, and uh, he works for community mental health for you know, a, a, a fraction of what he could make in private practice. And by the way, I, I have no nothing against uh, people earning a good income. It's not that. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm extra proud of that work because he does it consciously to make what I know are, are his, uh, his compassionate skills available to folks who might not be able to afford it otherwise. Um, he's also a singer songwriter. And uh, about eight years ago now, my phone rings. He said, hey, dad, he was doing some solo acoustic stuff. Said I'm putting a band together. I said I can't wait to go see your shows. And and uh, 
I play a little guitar. And, and he said, uh, said, well, I hope you'll see him from the stage. I want you to play guitar for me. So for the last eight years, every now and then I get to play weekend rock star with my kid playing his original music in front of people who seem to like it. You know, uh, we've made a couple of albums that together have sold dozens of copies. Online. <laughs> and, uh, and none of that matters. You know, my kid wants me as his side man playing his original music. Uh, and I'll tell you, you know, the amp goes to 11 and it's a spiritual experience. Yeah, just earlier today, he called me. He wanted my input on something. I gave him the best I could. He said, thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. I love you. And he hung up. <laughs> Those are the gifts of the program, not not driving a Ferrari. I drive a, an Italian car that starts with F, but it's a Fiat. It's not a Ferrari. So what the hell? Um, it, you know, and uh, and I have the, the love and respect of everybody in the, in the world for whom that's important to me. And I try to return that in equal measure. You know, um, what this is is not what I thought it would be. It is so much better, um, you know, and, and the connections, you know, I'm looking at two of my best friends. You're, I can see them here and there. You know, Neil and Karen have been my friends for decades. Um, you know, I fell in love with these guys in Ohio. And the fact that we live 658 miles apart uh, hasn't dimmed that one bit. I don't feel the slightest uh, diminishing of connection or, 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 or the way we know each other or the way we love each other, because, you know, we connected at the heart level the way Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to do, you know, and we have true love and, and, and true and a true bond. That's what I've experienced in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's given me everything, you know, and, and I'm able to walk around in the skin of the world exactly the way it is, uh, knowing who I am. And, and it's left me with a purpose. I'll leave you with this. You know, uh, I know what God wants for me. He wants me not to take that first sucker drink, no matter what, and to not be a jerk. It's pretty simple. And, and with God's help, you know, Maybe so far today I've accomplished that. Uh, it's been an honor to share the time with you. Thank you for your patience and 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 for giving me an opportunity to to share to the best of my ability these beautiful things I found uh, found in this hall. Thanks, thanks for asking me, Karen. It's a privilege. I'm done.